Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started as people are trickling in. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to UNC MD PhD programs 2021 virtual mini med school. If you missed last week's session on viruses and pandemics, the presentations and recordings are now up on our website, med.unc.edu slash mini med school under the past presentations tab. Tonight is our second session for this year's program and the topic is strokes. This session is also being recorded and will be uploaded to our website within the next week or so, so stay tuned. I'll just give a really quick introduction of our panelists. Um, my name is Miriam. I'm a fifth year in the MD-PhD program in the biomedical engineering department, and I will be co-hosting along with Kevin, a third year in the program. We also have Paige, first year, and Nate, a fellow third year, who will provide Q&A and technical support, as well as our student speaker, Sarah Glear, and Dr. Anna Felix, our faculty speaker. So let's get started. Uh, Sarah Glear is a fifth year in our program working in the neuroscience curriculum in the lab of Aishanil Belgar. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you guys so much for having me. So I'm just going to dive into it. Um, so here's a bit of a breakdown for the evening. I'm going to give you guys an introduction to stroke and to really understand what a stroke is and how it presents. Um, we have to dive into the normal neuroanatomy and some neurovascular supply. So definitely bear with me. Um, it can be a lot to take in at first, especially if you haven't been exposed to any of this before. Um, but I'm going to try to break it down simply um, so you all can really understand. And then we'll have a little bit of a break. And then Dr. Felix will really take us into the pathophysiology of a stroke um, and the clinical manifestations. So what is a stroke? Uh, we think of a stroke when a part of the brain is damaged because of a problem with the blood flow. And there are two types of problems that can happen. We can get clogging within these vessels. And another word to say that is an ischemic stroke, um, or we can have vessels that break open and these are called hemorrhagic strokes. And the result of these is that there's damage to parts of the brain that need that blood that can't get that blood. So in order to really understand this clinical presentation of a stroke, we have to first understand and tackle normal neuroanatomy. So when we're looking at the brain and we're viewing the brain, there are multiple different axes or multiple different ways that we can view the brain. Um, and three are called the horizontal plane, the coronal plane, and the sagittal plane. So if we were looking at the top of the brain, and looking down on it, and we were to take a slice through that, we would see the horizontal view. Um, and if we were to look at the front of the brain and take that axis, we would be able to see the coronal view. And then if we were to look at it from the side and take a slice through this axis, we would be able to see the sagittal view. And it's these different views are important because while we get some overlapping information, we get unique views of the brain um, that we wouldn't be able to fully see in one view or another view. Um, so this is some of the terminology that I wanted to acquaint you all with. And so you could see that these different views of the brain um, offer us unique insights. And this is looking at these different patterns on different on this neuroimaging test. And you can see that from these different views, we're able to see some overlapping information, but unique aspects of the brain that might tell us normal disease pathology. So here is the cortical brain anatomy, and I'm just going to focus on the outermost layers. Um, rather than deeper structures, because these are going to be super important and it's a good starting place. So we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And this line here separating the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe is called the uh, central sulcus. And this line here that's separating the temporal lobe and the parietal parietal lobe is called the sylvian fissure. And these are two distinct lines that we refer to in anatomy and can help us really separate these lobes. 
So first, um, we're going to talk about functional frontal lobe anatomy. And the three areas that I really want to focus on are the prefrontal cortex. And you can think of the prefrontal cortex as your decision making area. It helps you plan um, and decide things ahead of time. Um, another word for it is like executive function. Um, it's really involved in problem solving. Then we have Broca's area, and this region uh, helps us produce speech and we have these motor areas and these motor areas are in charge of controlling our muscles and our limbs. Next, we have the parietal lobe and the parietal lobe is heavily involved in uh, sensation and receiving sensory information. So the primary sensory cortex is the primary area where all of that data comes in. And these association areas, this area here in orange, these areas help us analyze that information. So we might feel something on our hand, that information goes to the primary sensory cortex. And these association areas connect with other regions of the brain to help tell us things of texture and weight and the feel of an object maybe. So these association areas are involved in data analysis. And these two areas, the motor and the sensory areas, uh, have this special division called the homunculus. And this means little person. And we call it that because the distribution of these cells that receive this information um, look like this little person. So the sensory or the sensory information for our feet and our lower limbs, as well as our motor are located most medially. And then as we go out more laterally, um, we have our hand represented here and our face represented here. And that's the same on this side. And what I mean by lateralization is that our brain is a little bit funky. So the left side of our body, the information that's carrying everything we need on the left side crosses and it actually goes to the right side of our brain. And everything that's on the right side of our, of our body will cross and go to the left side of our brain. So there's distinct lateralization or crossing of that information within the brain. Um, next, we have the occipital lobe, and that's in the back here. Um, just like the primary and the association areas of um, the sensory parietal lobe, the primary visual cortex is going to receive all of the raw information on our visual fields from our eyes, and the visual, visual association area helps to analyze that information so we can see color and depth um, and all of these uh, deeper aspects of our sensation. And lastly, we have the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe um, is really involved in higher order sensory processing. But three things I really wanted to focus on are Wernicke's area. This area is involved in comprehension of speech. Um, we have the primary auditory cortex. So um, how we analyze and process auditory information. And then we have a limbic association area. And this area is really important in uh, emotion and memory formation. So how does our brain process, integrate, and act on all of this information? So first we have neurons and neurons are really the workhorse of our brain. So if I zoom in here, this dark pink area is called gray matter and that's where these cell bodies, um, these cell parts of the neurons are located. Um, and they have this long axon that travels in this white matter um, that helps carry that information from the cell body to other regions of the brain. Um, and these guys are really important in processing and receiving information. And they can come in all shapes and sizes. And usually the location and the function of neurons are, are what determine the shapes and sizes. So neurons have this coordinated control. So we have individual neuronal activity. So these guys fire in response to environmental stimuli or internal stimuli. So you have thoughts. So these guys are gonna fire. And then all of these firing neurons, they fire in a coordinated way in order to communicate with each other. So it's in this populational neuronal activity 
and these connections that allow us to process, analyze, and interpret information. And then all of that populational neuronal activity, once we've analyzed and processed information, is sent out in long axons and nerves to our body in order to exert coordinated control. So neurons, these workhorses of our brain, need a lot of energy and oxygen to function. And our blood supplies this and is crucial to maintaining this normal function. Um, so here's how the blood gets from our heart to the brain. So it starts in our heart and there are two sets of vessels that carry it up to the brain. So our carotids, and those are what you might feel on the side of your neck for a pulse. Um, and there are deeper ones called the vertebral arteries. And these two sets are gonna carry our main blood supply up to the brain. And they converge in this region on the inferior underneath the deepest part of our brain into this circle called the circle of Willis. And this is the most important part of our neurovasculature. And this is, the, this is what's gonna supply uh, the blood to our brain. Um, so you can see there's something, so here is the internal carotid and I think it's much better visualized here. Um, and these are gonna be our vertebral arteries down here. And you can see our basal artery here is located here on this inferior or underneath this part of the brain. Um, and the three that I really wanna focus on that are gonna be most important are the anterior cerebral artery. So they're gonna come up here and go deeper the middle cerebral artery. So that comes off the internal carotid and go here. And it's a little bit harder to visualize, but the posterior cerebral artery, which comes here, and it's gonna to go to the posterior aspect of our brain. So you can see the blood supply to the cortex um, is uh, distributed along the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, and the posterior cerebral artery. And they all supply a little bit to all of these overlapping um, regions that we talked about earlier. So the frontal is up here, the parietal is this most middle aspect, the occipital is back here, um, and the temporal lobes are here. Um, and you can see there are regions called watershed regions here where these, where they're, they're basically transition points between where the anterior meets the middle meets the posterior. So if we circle back to that homunculus, so that distribution of where our limbs and our upper body is represented, the anterior cerebral artery in orange here is really going to be supplying motor and sensory information to our lower half of our body, while the middle cerebral artery is going to supply the brunt of our upper body, so our face, our hands, while the uh, posterior cerebral artery is going to be supplying the occipital lobe where we have all of our visual information going. So just to recap, um, the vessels and the function of the area supplied, because this is going to be really important for understanding why a blockage in one region might lead to certain specific symptoms. Um, so the anterior cerebral artery is going to have motor function of the lower body and sensations from the lower body. The middle cerebral artery in green here, this is going to support apply blood to areas in charge of motor function of the upper body, sensations of the upper body, uh, Broca's area, so the production of speech, um, and temporal area, so uh, that's Wernicke's area, so comprehension of speech, and then the posterior cerebral artery, so that's going to be our visual occipital lobe, so vision, um, the ability to read is another example of the function that it supplies. So how can we use our knowledge of neuroanatomy function and blood supply to really understand stroke? Um, so depending on where the stroke occurs, is it in the ACA? Is it in the MCA? Is it in the PCA? We will have a corresponding loss of normal function in those regions without the blood supply. So just to circle back, what is a stroke? So a stroke, part of the brain is damaged because of a problem with blood flow. And there are two main types. So we have that clogging. So there's something stuck in here that is not allowing the blood to flow through, or we can have weakened vessel walls and they break open. Um, and we can have bleeding into a site with no blood flow downstream. So these are two ways um, that strokes might occur.
So just to recap everything we've learned here, we've talked about strokes, we've looked at the brain, like different views of the brain, um, we've covered some functional neuroanatomy, and we've covered the basics of some neurovascular supply. And it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to learn, um, but it's important to get a sense of the normalcy because once you understand what is happening in the normal, you can recognize uh, when something has gone wrong. And the unique thing about neuro is that we can tell a lot from a physical exam. So when we're in a room with somebody and we're testing different nerves, we're looking for different signs, we can often pinpoint where the lesion or where the disruption in the system is just on physical exam because we know what sensory or motor information that they've lost. So thank you so much for your time and your attention and bearing with me. Um, and I will take any questions that you might have. Or did you guys wanna wait for questions at the end? Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a really excellent overview of neuroanatomy and kind of an intro to strokes for our audience. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please go ahead and populate them in the Q&A box. Um, that should be available at the bottom of your screen. Or if you have any technical issues, feel free to email us at uncminimedschool at gmail.com. And we do have a couple of Q and A's already. Um, uh, what we'll do is I'll go ahead and call on the individual. And if, if they're able to do so, Kevin will unmute them and you can ask your question live. Otherwise, Paige will go ahead and read it out loud for you. So. Our first question is from Tristan Miller. Um, Kevin, if you're, okay, go ahead, Tristan. I see that Tristan is unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, my name is Tristan Miller. I just started at UNC in the Blood Research Center. However, my undergraduate degree is in neuroscience, so I'm very familiar with some of these aspects. I just had a question, is uh, intracranial aneurysm the same or similar to a stroke? And can strokes be hereditary from genetic or environmental uh, epidemiological factors? Hi, Tristan, thanks for your question. Um, some of these I might defer to later. So aneurysm, I think about um, weakening of those vessel walls, which can lead to like these hemorrhagic strokes. Um, and I think some of your questions, yes, um, strokes can be genetic um, and hereditary and there are multiple risk factors um, for strokes. Um, I might leave some of those to Dr. Felix because she will have um, some specifics of the risk factors um, and specific epidemiological factors that lead to stroke. Thank you. Thanks, Tristan. And our second question is from Firzan Akinja Cole. Um, if Kevin, you're able to unmute her. Yeah, I had a question about uh, like if a person is autistic, but you know, is speaking basically, which parts of the brain are impacted by the autism? So that's a tough question. We, uh, autism spectrum disorder encompasses um, a number of different things. Um, it can be a clinical syndrome and we're learning a lot more about the genetics of it, um, but we don't fully understand how that developmental um, disorder affects the entirety of the brain. Um, and we're learning more and more that individuals with autism spectrum disorder are unique in their presentations and that they all don't have the, they can display some of the same symptoms, but some of them or some, dis, some across the spectrum, they can have unique um, individual characteristics. So that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research in, in um, the unsatisfying answer to your really good question is that we're not sure um, what parts of the brain are affected. I think somebody said they would like to answer this question. 
Oh, this is just uh, our technical support indicating that the question is being answered oh, live. Oh, oh I yeah, see. But thank okay. you. Sure. It's, it's a re sure. really great question. <laughs> um, I noticed that we have um, one attendee who has raised their hand. I don't know if they have a question they want to ask. Um, it looks like Gretchen, Gretchen Poor. Uh, Kevin, look, if you want. Looks like we can't enable talking for Gretchen. Uh, I see. Okay. Well, um, if you still have any questions, Gretchen, please uh, post them in the Q&A and we can get to them um, once we are able to visualize the question. Otherwise, again, if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A box or for technical questions, you can let us know at our email. Um, and at this time, um, if there aren't any other questions, then we can go ahead and take, I'll say, an eight minute break um, and get back started again around seven o'clock. So feel free to get up, get a drink of water, take a bio break, and we'll meet back here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in eight minutes. All right. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
All right, we're gonna wrap up the break in just a minute. I know that we had a few more questions that came up and I think what we'll do is we'll save those questions for the end of Dr. Felix's presentation in case they're addressed during the presentation or for her to also help address the questions afterwards so we can stay on time. All right, welcome back to everybody who is coming back after our break. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna give a really quick introduction to Dr. Anna Felix. She completed her medical school training at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Her internship at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, residency at Tufts also in Boston, Massachusetts, and her fellowship in vascular neurology at Leahy Clinic in Boston. Dr. Felix is a physician educator with a clinical focus on neurology, trained in vascular neurology. She currently serves as an embedded neurologist in the internal medicine and geriatric specialty clinics, where she serves to improve access to specialty care and reduce the burden of neurological disorders. She also works as the lead neurologist for the Brain and Body Health Program at UNC, a program that works with the NFL Trust and retired athletes. As an educator, Dr. Felix co-leads the foundational course in neurosciences for the School of Medicine and serves as academic advisor to a cohort of 70 to 80 students annually. Dr. Felix's research interests include stroke and headache prevention, as well as improving neurologic education for students, colleagues, patients, and families alike. Dr. Felix led early exploration of the use of telemedicine in Robeson County, an area with no inpatient neurologists and the highest burden of stroke in North Carolina. Dr. Felix is currently a medical alumni distinguished teaching professor and has received numerous awards at UNC and at the national level for her teaching of medical students. Thank you so much, Dr. Felix, for being here. Please take it away. Gosh, thank you so much. I always love meeting with you all and uh, I'm so glad to be part of this wonderful opportunity of, with the Many Medical School. I am delighted to be here with the UNC MD PhD program and uh, so many of you participants. So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I really appreciate Sarah's introduction, which uh, was brilliantly done. So thank you, Sarah. So the next uh, part of our time we'll spend together really focused on the clinical aspects of stroke. And again, as questions come up, feel free to um, post them and we'll try and answer them all at the end of our time and make sure we have enough time to answer questions. So what are our learning objectives? Uh, our medical students are very familiar with this term. We wanna know what it is that we hope to achieve by the end of this time together. So at the end of this session, I'm very hopeful that you'll be able to answer the following five questions. The first is, what is a stroke? And we've already had some brilliant questions that uh, have addressed some of the issues around this. What is, the di what is different about stroke in North Carolina? And then how, how do you know if someone may be having a stroke? Which common drugs are used to treat and or prevent stroke? And then what are five things that I can do today to lower my risk for stroke? So we'll focus on those five elements um, and hopefully make this interesting to you. So do play, please make a note of any questions and we will try and get to as many as possible at the end. Some of you have been familiar with a movie called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And that is what you think of as stroke. Uh, there are um, some other movies where stroke has a leading role, but this is probably the quintessential one. And when thinking about this movie, if you've watched it, it's usually quite depressing. It's uh, very striking. And so, immediately one starts to understand that stroke is a lot of different things. And so how is it that we have one term to explain so many different things? So the question is, what is a stroke? So we've already heard from Sarah that stroke has to do with blood flow. And so I think of stroke as essentially a plumbing problem. And whether the plumbing problem in your house is one where you have a burst pipe, which of course causes a huge mess, or whether you have a plumbing problem because you have a clog, a huge mess ensues. And stroke is very much the same. It's a plumbing problem. And so the plumbing to the brain, of course, to different parts of the brain, whether there's an interruption of blood flow because of a clot or whether there's interruption of blood flow because of a leak, either way, we have a very serious medical problem. When we refer to blockages, we refer to ischemic stroke. And so we'll use this term from here on 
And when we refer to blood vessel rupture, we refer to hemorrhagic stroke. So the question earlier about aneurysm, aneurysms are weakness, uh, areas of weakness in the blood vessel wall, and those typically would lead to blood vessel rupture and hemorrhagic stroke, a very specific type called subarachnoid hemorrhage. So when we experience a problem with the plumbing to the brain, we then have symptoms that are, are referable to that part of the brain. And as Sarah beautifully outlined, there are so many different parts of the brain that control very unique portions of our body. As Sarah mentioned, the left brain is typically responsible for the right side of our body and vice versa. And uniquely for most right-handed people, the left brain is also responsible for the production of language and the understanding of language. And so if the stroke happens to be on the left side of the brain, it will likely cause trouble with language if uh, the person is right-handed and left-sided symptoms. And we'll talk some more about that in a moment. So the different parts of the brain control different activities. And as a result, people who have a stroke don't all look alike. And so you might wonder why that neighbor who says they had a stroke looks just fine and is walking around and has no obvious problem, whereas somebody else might be wheelchair bound and unable to walk. So different parts of the brain cause different symptoms. The word stroke is not a very good word and I think probably adds to the confusion around the condition, but it refers to the suddenness of onset of symptoms. So it's a like a strike, if you hit somebody with a bat or strike somebody, that's where the word stroke comes from. The other term used is cerebrovascular accident, and that is even less uh, likely to be popular these days because there's really nothing accidental about this, um, as we'll talk about in a moment. So it's a sudden onset, and the symptoms always have some focal origin. What that means is they arise from a very specific part of the brain a very focal point. And typically, because we know the anatomy, because as Sarah outlined, the anatomy of the blood vessels are very uh, structured and organized to supply a certain part of the brain, we know that the origin of the stroke is of a vascular origin. Now, the one exception to this rule is subarachnoid hemorrhage. As I mentioned earlier, people who may experience a ruptured aneurysm, uh, the blood will typically leak into the subarachnoid space. And that typically does not present with a focal deficit, but rather either altered consciousness, loss of consciousness. And so even though subarachnoid hemorrhage is technically a stroke, we think of it as a very special kind of stroke that is very unique and has very specific pathological clinical features, we also treat it a little differently to other strokes. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is a sort of its own thing. So when we think about all kinds of strokes, I already said that there's two types, the ischemic type, the blockage, the hemorrhagic type, about 85% of strokes are ischemic. So on the whole, it's much more likely to see somebody have an ischemic stroke than a hemorrhagic stroke. And if we look at just the ischemic strokes, the breakdown is about 20% of those people have what we call atherothrombotic cerebrovascular disease. What does that mean? That means that that carotid artery we were seeing in Sarah's uh, pictures basically is filled with gunk. Uh, that's a very technical neurological term. Uh, but in fact, the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessel thickens and um, uh, over time, there's just less space for the blood to flow through and eventually it blocks off. Cardioembolic strokes form about 20% of strokes and those originate from a clot that comes from somewhere else, typically the heart. All blood, starts, uh, all blood flow starts in the heart and then moves up into the brain. So one can imagine that if you had some sort of irregular heart rhythm or valvular disease and had a clot in the heart, every heartbeat leads to a possibility of that clot then moving along with blood flow. And since the brain receives a significant amount of blood flow every heartbeat, there's a chance that one of those pieces of clot could move along with the blood flow and lodge itself in a blood vessel. And depending on where it lodges is where the symptoms will um, occur. And then there is this other type 
which uh, is about 25% of strokes called the lacuna strokes. And, you know, we always like to be cool and, and have fancy words. So lacune is the French word for a very small lake. And the lacuna strokes are typically very, very small strokes. In this picture here, you'll see there's a tiny little hole in here. Once the stroke heals, it leaves a little scar. And that scar is uh, essentially seen as a little hole hole uh, where the normal tissue would have been is now just filled with uh, fluid. And these are typically caused in the combination of high blood pressure with diabetes. And what happens there is that the very, very, very tiny blood vessels um, thicken and the inside thickens so much so that even a single red blood cell cannot pass through there. And when that happens, it blocks off blood flow to these very tiny areas and a stroke ensues. Because we know that different parts of the brain control different areas, there are very tiny areas of the brain that control very large parts of the body. And so if one were to have a stroke, as in this case, anywhere along the brain stem, then one can have a lot of symptoms, even though it's a very tiny stroke. Similarly, one might have a larger stroke in a different part of the brain and have fewer symptoms. Cryptogenic strokes are about 30%. Cryptogenic means we don't know where they came from. And despite looking for a cause, we can't find one. Um, over time, this number is actually reduced because of course, every year we figure out some new underlying condition that might trigger strokes. Um, and then other is sort of a hodgepodge of different causes. When we look at hemorrhagic strokes, that's about 15% of all strokes. Uh, the majority by far are what we call intracerebral hemorrhages. These are uh, uh, areas of blood that's, uh, that sort of exsanguinates into the brain itself and it disrupts the brain tissue. Uh, these are very commonly seen in patients who have high blood pressure or bleeding problems. And about 30% are that special group I mentioned, the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here we have a CAT scan of a patient and um, what you can see, the white stuff is the um, skull. And so the bone shows up very bright white on all of these pictures. And as it turns out on a CAT scan, there's only three things that show up bright white like this. They are bone, they are blood, and they are contrast, which we can administer to the patient. And so this, these are non-contrast head scans. And so we can see that there's bone all the way around and there really shouldn't be any bone in the, inside the head. And so this big lump here is a bleeding type of stroke. Similarly here, the blood is actually diffusely spread all along the um, lines of the subarachnoid space. And that's why we know this person's had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is just a little uh, diagram to show a little bit more about the difference between embolic strokes and hemodynamic strokes. If we start on the right, the hemodynamic strokes, these are the people who have, for example, carotid disease. This is a picture of the inside of a blood vessel, lots of crud that accumulates. And then as this accumulates, you have less and less blood flow going through and eventually no blood going through. And that causes the stroke versus the embolic, which can occur from the heart, or you can actually have what we call rupture of this plaque inside the blood vessel, or sometimes it just gets kind of um, sticky and platelets as Sarah's beautiful slide demonstrated, like to have little uh, parties and they have a little party and they hang out and form a little gang. And then this little gang breaks up and causes all sorts of trouble northward by blocking off blood vessels and then causing a stroke. So we talked a little bit about embolic events and they typically come from the heart. Some of the conditions that are very highly associated with clots forming in the heart and then moving include atrial fibrillation, which you may have heard about. And atrial fibrillation increases as we age. That risk goes up as we age. Uh, prosthetic valves, uh, if anyone on the call, anyone on the webinar has a prosthetic valve, you may be familiar that you have to take medication typically to prevent um, clots from forming. Sometimes in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction or acute heart attack, uh, you can have loss of muscle function such that the heart predisposes to clot formation. Cardiomyopathy is a condition, again, where the heart muscle is not functioning properly, and that leads to a risk for clot formation. Endocarditis, which is a, a condition that causes, that is associated with an infection of the heart valves. And so every heartbeat, um, the valves have uh, 
crud, as I like to call it, that's uh, hanging loose. And with every heartbeat, that can break off and move along with the blood flow to the brain. And then um, less commonly, something called a ventricular aneurysm, which is a weakness in the area of the ventricle of the heart that can just let blood pool in there and thus form clots. Um, a rare card, heart tumors can occur, intracardiac tumors, they're not very common. And there is a condition called patent foramen ovale that is very important, particularly in younger people who might have stroke or predisposition to stroke, particularly if they have another uh, underlying condition that might predispose them to clots. So some of the other things we need to think about that perhaps in that other column are uh, conditions called dissections. This is where the blood vessel wall tears and then a clot forms and either moves northward to cause a blockage or sometimes the um, uh, vessel wall itself forms a big bruise inside the vessel wall and that blocks off blood flow. Um, that can happen in people who have certain genetic predispositions to weakness in the connective tissue. Oral contraceptives are associated with an increased risk for stroke and it depends on the dose and the type. Migraine is very slightly associated with stroke and of course migraine is very common. So I do not want you to leave this uh, webinar believing that all migraine is gonna lead to stroke, that is not the case. But there is a slightly increased risk, particularly in migraine with aura, for stroke if we follow those people over time. Sickle cell disease is a very uh, painful and uh, genetic, again, inherited disorder that is uh, strongly associated with strokes. And one of the examples where by making small changes, we've been able to make a huge difference in children with sickle cell disease to reduce their stroke risk. Uh, can, uh, uh, substances like cocaine and similar compounds are highly associated with stroke. Inflammation of blood vessels like arteritis, venous sinus thrombosis is a condition where the clot happens in the veins of the brain. So just like the rest of our body, we have blood flow in through the arteries, we have blood flow out through the veins, and it turns out the veins can clot. And this condition we see um, um, rarely, but when it happens, we tend to see in people who have very serious sinus infections, and sometimes in people postpartum, um, that is a time when the, there are high risk for venous sinus thrombosis. And then two rare ones that are worth mentioning are this condition called reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome. Uh, we see this a fair bit and um, the beauty of that is that people get better and typically this recovers fully. We sometimes see it with certain medications used in transplant patients. We sometimes will see it in people who have very high blood pressures. And then there is this rare condition called CADASIL, which is the cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. First described in about the 50s, this is a condition that's inherited. There's a specific gene associated with this. And these are patients who typically present in a family with recurrent episodes of stroke over time. They tend to have very small strokes, the lacuna type I mentioned, and a very strong association with migraine. So these are some of the things that can lead to stroke. But what about mini stroke? I'm sure you've heard the term mini stroke. And if ever there was a term that caused confusion, I think mini stroke probably takes the uh, hat. Because if you uh, have ever watched a movie, there's the mini me, you'd think maybe mini stroke means just a small stroke. And I've already uh, shared with you that, that really the stroke depends on which part of the brain is affected. And as mentioned earlier, a small stroke or a small part of the brain being affected can cause a large deficit. So the term mini stroke really doesn't seem to apply. And really what I want you to know is that mini stroke refers to a transient ischemic attack. Now again, attack is not a good word, but that's the word we have for now. And the point I'm making is that neither stroke nor mini stroke nor TIA are very useful terms these days when we think about the treatment of stroke, which is really at the core of all the uh, things we know about stroke, what's important is to understand that there is a difference between a mini stroke and a stroke, but the difference is just time. So a transient ischemic attack or a mini stroke is just a transient episode, whereas a stroke is a permanent episode. Again, neurological dysfunction, and it results from ischemia or blood flow loss, and there is no dead tissue. So it's like in the cowboy movies, you'd see somebody goes bang, bang, you're dead. 
stroke doesn't happen like that. Most of the time there's some cells that are very susceptible to death immediately and others take time to die. A TIA is where the neurons are kind of going like, mm, should we die? I'm not, not sure. Hang on, let's, let's see if we can keep going. And if we can reverse whatever's causing the symptoms, the cells don't need to die. So um, this has become a real um, helpful term uh, in, with the advent of improved MRI. So MRI technology has really helped us with this because when we meet a patient, the only other difference is time. So if the symptoms get better quickly, we might think it's a TIA or a mini stroke, whereas if their symptoms are permanent, then we call it a stroke. But really MRI is the way we can tease this out. If the MRI shows no loss of uh, cell, uh, no loss of tissue in the sense that there's no dead tissue, we know it's a TIA or a mini stroke. Whereas if there is cell death or tissue death, then that is a stroke. So that's a little bit of the difference. So for practical purposes, up till recently, we used to say anybody who gets all better within 24 hours has had a TIA. But in truth, what we know is that most people who have a TIA or a mini stroke are all better within about four hours. So four hours or less of symptoms, probably a TIA or a mini stroke, more than four hours, probably a stroke, but we'd have to get an MRI to sort it out. Okay, so why is this whole business of TIA and mini stroke important? Well, it turns out that if you think about it, patients who are having symptoms, even if they get all better, something is going on. And those are people who are at very high risk for having another episode and maybe next time they're not so lucky. So I think of TIA as really winning the lottery. You had a terrible event, some blockage occurred, and then by some miracle of nature, that blockage opened up and you're back to normal. However, it is really crucial to figure out where that blockage came from so we can prevent the very next event. And if we look at some of the data, about 10 to 15% of patients who come in with a mini stroke or a TIA will go on to have a stroke in the next three months. Now think about it. If I gave you a 15% chance of winning that big lottery that just ran, you'd probably buy a lottery ticket. So that is not an inconsequential number. And what's more striking is that about half of these people will have their stroke in the first two days after their first TIA. So immediately you get the sense that when there's a TIA event, something that has triggered that event is ongoing and we need to act quickly to prevent the next event and to prevent a permanent event like a stroke. So um, if you look at all patients who come in with a TIA, at the end of a week, 5% of those will have a stroke. And what we've been able to do is sort out what are the things about somebody that might put them at higher risk. And it turns out if your symptoms last longer than 10 minutes, if your symptoms include aphasia, which is difficulty with language, if you're older than 60, if you happen to also have diabetes, and if you have weakness as one of your symptoms. So it's not just feeling a little off or feeling a little dizzy. It's like my arm didn't work or my leg didn't work. And we actually have a calculator that we can use to put this all together. And we come up with something called the ABCD squared score. And so for each of the items, you'll see A is age, B is blood pressure, C are the clinical features of unilateral weakness or speech impairment, D is the duration of symptoms, and D is also diabetes, hence the squared, and each of these gets a point. And you immediately start to, say, to see that if you have an ABCD squared uh, score that's higher than two to three, you're probably at much higher risk for stroke than somebody who has an ABCD squared criteria of maybe one. And that's how we decide whether somebody might need to stay in the hospital, get an expedited outpatient workup, or um, maybe just needs to see you, you know, in the, call me in the morning. So that's a little bit about mini stroke. But what about North Carolina? I think it's fabulous that we're talking about stroke because it turns out that the statistics are very important. So in the time I've been speaking, you know, the last 20 so minutes, uh, about you know five to six people have had a stroke and have died from a stroke. So every 40 seconds in the US, somebody has a stroke and every four minutes, someone dies from a stroke. And these are pretty striking numbers. It is also the leading cause of disability in the US. So we have almost 800,000 strokes a year. And what's very important is that about a quarter of those are recurrent strokes. So these are people who have a stroke and then they have another stroke. And the more events you have, the more at risk you are for uh, severe disability. 
Um, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in Americans, which is interesting because when I first started talking about stroke years and years ago, it was the third leading cause of death. So in my lifetime, I've seen it move down, which is exciting. And some of what I'll talk about later this evening will share why this is so exciting and what you can do that will impact your own risk uh, for stroke. So there are things we can do that change these numbers. If you look at the numbers, they are staggering. When you take into account the care for somebody with stroke, uh, the fact that their caregiver sometimes has to give up their job, the fact that it costs when you can no longer work because you had a stroke, we're looking, looking at about $46 billion in the US in the last few years as the estimated costs for um, stroke-related medical costs and disability. So very costly. And although, as I mentioned, stroke death rates have declined, the interesting thing is that there are huge disparities amongst all race and ethnicities. So depending on where you are born and depending on your genetics and depending on where you live in the US, your stroke risk is different. And also your likelihood of dying for, from your stroke is different. So, sorry about that. The risk of having a first stroke is nearly twice as high for blacks as for whites. And uh, blacks have the highest rate of death, death due to stroke in the US. And uh, Hispanics have seen an increase in death rates since 2013. Um, we do know that stroke risk increases with age. In 2009, about 34% of people hospitalized for, for stroke were under 65. Um, and that mirrors some of the data that we see with obesity rates and diabetes rates. Um, but um, what I wanted to point out is that these uh, higher rates in different ethnic uh, backgrounds and different races is something that's existed for a long time and um, is something we've been studying for a long time. We don't completely understand it, but it's something that will undoubtedly have a tremendous impact in research coming up in the next decade. If we look at hospitalization rates, this is a map of the US from 2015 to 2017 by county. These were 65 and older. The dark colors is more hospitalization rates with stroke and the lighter colors are fewer. And you can immediately see that in the southeastern part of the US, we just have more people with stroke than anywhere else in the country. And this disparity of North and South Carolina, Florida, all the way to Mississippi, and even parts of Texas has existed for over 50 years. And so we are called the stroke belt. That's what this area of the US is called. And North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, we carry the title of the buckle of the stroke belt because we actually have even higher rates than everybody else. So really important that in North Carolina, we have these high rates. And as a result, we're actually, some of the people in the state are doing work to not just improve care to stroke patients, but to understand these disparities. For example, if you live in one of these dark states, uh, dark counties, and you move to one of the light counties, what happens to your stroke risk, right? And it turns out that somebody is actually looking at that with the regard study. And it turns out maybe it changes. Uh, we're not quite sure yet. So these studies take a long time. When looking at mortality rates, who dies? These were 35 and older. Um, again, you can see that the south, southeastern part of the US is very highly represented. And North and South Carolina, again, have very high rates. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, and I feel like uh, webinars like this one are just a way forward to hopefully get us out of this uh, situation. So what are stroke symptoms? Well, Sarah's already shown you these pictures. We have these territories of blood flow, the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery. This is looking from the side. This is looking from the top. And as a result, if one has to, if you have a stroke where you lose blood flow to one of these areas of the brain, we know exactly what symptoms um, occur. The important aspect though, is that there is a lot of redundancy built in, thank goodness, in our brain blood supply. It turns out it's really important. So thank goodness we have that. And so the carotid circulation uh, has redundancy with the circle of Willis, with the posterior circulation, of vertebral artery circulation. And as a result, all these little vessels actually meet up deep in the brain. And there's lots of ways that the brain receives blood supply. So fortunately, we're not dependent on just one blood vessel. And that's one of the reasons that if we have a very slowly progressive blockage of a blood vessel, we may have fewer symptoms than if we have a sudden interruption of blood flow. 
because over time, these other blood vessels can sometimes make up the difference. It's like if you're on the highway and there's a traffic jam, um, if you can use the side roads, you'll eventually get to your destination. It may take you a little longer. Uh, that's typically what will happen with a slow, gradual decline in blood flow is that the brain is pretty good at finding what we call collateral circulation and uh, improves blood flow to some of the tissue. So maybe the deficits won't be as marked as somebody who has a very sudden large uh, uh, blockage of blood flow. So this is a reminder of what Sarah showed us. Remember, it all starts down here in the heart. And then we have these beautiful uh, carotid arteries coming up. They're on the front of the neck. But equally important are these little squiggly, tinier ones in the back of the brain. These are the ones that uh, supply the back of the brain and they travel along the neck. And one of the issues that can happen with these blood vessels is they can tear and they'll tear with neck injury. They can uh, sometimes tear with uh, chiropractic manipulation of the cervical spine specifically. Um, so these are very prone to injury because they travel along the cervical spine. And once you have a problem in the blood vessel here, you can have um, a loss of blood flow either northward, as I call it, or um, a clot can form and move northward. So if the carotid artery blocks up, um, typically the symptoms are transient loss of vision, what we call transient monocular blindness. It's like a curtain comes over your eye or shade comes over your eye and then lifts up again. As we mentioned earlier, these tend to be short-lived symptoms, transient, usually minutes. And if you have that symptom, we always worry about carotid disease. And it's always on the same side as the carotid artery. We just talked about how things are um, on the other side of the brain is uh, the left body is controlled by the right uh, brain and so on. But the carotid artery, if there's disease on the right carotid artery, the symptom will be in the right eye. And then along with that, you might have on the opposite side of your body weakness clumsiness or numbness, and that's typically hand, face, and arm. And if we involve what we call the dominant hemisphere, that's your left hemisphere for right-handed people, uh, you'll have some language disturbances, sometimes also for lefties, but uh, certainly for right-handed people. And then typically with carotid disease, the visual symptoms don't always happen at the same time as the weakness on the other side. So sometimes what will happen is somebody will come in and they've had episodes of vision loss that get all better, and then their stroke actually happens later. So this is what happens if we block a carotid artery. If we block a vertebral artery, the ones in the back of the neck, it turns out the vertebral basilar system is responsible for very high value real estate in the brain. I'm talking like the highest value real estate where everything travels through very, very tiny areas. And so symptoms here include double vision, what we call diplopia, um, graying or clouding or blurring of both vision, of both eyes, that's binocular loss of vision. Uh, one can have either one side or both sides weak or clumsiness or numb. And we get lots of cranial nerve problems. Cranial nerves are the nerves that supply most of our head and neck. So we have trouble swallowing, dysphagia, and trouble articulating speech, potato in your mouth. And then along with that, there's loss of balance, a vertigo, a lack of coordination or staggering. And unfortunately, this often looks, makes the patient look like they're drunk. And so there have been uh, some tragic stories where people are thought to just be inebriated when in fact they're having a posterior circulation stroke. So this is what a posterior circulation actually looks like. We can see it. Uh, this is an MRA. So it's an MRI image of the blood vessels. And here we have the carotid artery. And of course, uh, by default, just so you know, the left side of the image is actually the right carotid artery. And here is the... Uh, uh, right side of the image is the left carotid artery, and here are the two vertebrals, and they form this uh, single blood vessel called the basilar artery. So we can see these blood vessels in real time and actually know whether there's a blockage there or not. So how do you know if somebody's having symptoms of a stroke? The acronym that we recommend um, non uh, medical people or people in the initial stages of evaluation like uh, uh, medics and uh, people evaluating patients in the field is fast. So you've got to be fast. Every minute counts. Every brain cell that doesn't get blood flow is going to die within about four minutes. So you don't have much time. So you want to look at F for face. Do they have any facial droop? 
A for arm weakness. You can have them hold their arms side by side like they're holding a pizza box and see if they can hold both arms up. Somebody who's having a stroke may have weakness on one side such that they cannot hold up one arm. S stands for speech difficulty, as I mentioned, the hot potato, the sounding like they're inebriated or just unable to produce language. And the T stands for time, it's time to call 911. Now, some people have uh, added B fast, the B before it uh, for balance problems and the E for eye problems. I don't know that it's helpful. I think fewer letters are often easier to remember. This is how you would be able to think through if you see somebody at the supermarket or at the parking lot and they're acting kind of weird and you're wondering, are they just, did they have too much to drink last night? You can do a quick assessment by looking for a face droop, arm weakness, speech difficulty and call 911 if in doubt. Because what else could it be? So if it's not a stroke, what is it? Well, if they have permanent deficits, meaning it's a fixed deficit, it's not changing over time, certainly brain tumors can do that. Encephalitis, particularly herpes simplex encephalitis can do that. And multiple sclerosis can sometimes present that way. If the symptoms come and go or they um, get all better, we always think of seizure. There's a condition called a Todd's paralysis, which is um, essentially looks like a stroke. Somebody has a seizure, which may be unwitnessed. And after that event, they're actually weak on one side of their body. Typically that'll get better over time. Migraine can cause weakness, looks just like a stroke. Low sugar or very high sugars can cause symptoms that look just like a stroke. Labyrinthine dysfunction, that's the inner ear components can, can cause symptoms similar to stroke. Syncope is what we call fainting. And certainly when you lose consciousness, is it just a faint? or is it a subarachnoid hemorrhage? We don't always know. Myasthenia is a rare condition that affects the, uh, the connection between the nerve and the muscle. And those folks can present with trouble swallowing, they can have droopy eyelids, they can even have double vision. So sometimes it's hard to sort out if they're having a stroke-like episode or myasthenia gravis. And then there's amyloid angiopathy, a fairly common condition as we age where blood vessels just can't they get kind of loosey-goosey and there is leakage of red cells into the surrounding brain. And there's certainly a higher risk for um, the bleeding kind of stroke in those patients. So when we see somebody, uh, once they arrive to us, uh, typically we do a lot of uh, educational programs with our pre-hospital team. But once they reach the hospital, and there was a question about that earlier, how do we know what's going on? Is it a stroke or is it a TIA? Well, the first rule of thumb is assume it probably probably is, because if it's a seizure and they're all better, I have a little bit of time to sort that out. But if they're having a stroke, I need to act fast. So we always have these rules. We always make sure that the patient is stable. So we have these ABCs, the airway, the breathing, the circulation. We make sure that you're okay. And then we have something called a screening neurological exam. There's actually a tool called the NIH stroke scale that gives us a numeric value to how somebody might present. And then our best friend and our most useful tool is the non-contrast head CT scan. This is how we can distinguish whether somebody's having the ischemic type of stroke, 85% chance, or the hemorrhagic stroke, that 15% chance. Because from here on, whichever one you're having, everything is different in the treatment. If you're having an ischemic stroke where there's a blockage, we need to open that up. Whereas if you're having a hemorrhagic stroke, boy, I do not want to cause you to bleed. I actually need to stop the bleeding. So it's a very different approach. And once we've sorted that out, we can then look, uh, find the cause for the stroke and try and prevent the next one, as well as help the patient with their rehabilitation and recovery. So a little bit about MRI and CT for stroke. Um, Sarah showed us some beautiful MRI images. I showed you some very simple CT images before. CT is very quick and easy. You can be on and off the table in uh, under a, few, a couple of minutes. So it takes actually longer to get you on and off the table than it does to take the scan, get the scan. So the CT scan is a very quick way. It does involve radiation, just like an X-ray. Um, whereas an MRI, we can do all sorts of beautiful tweaks. And some of our colleagues here from the MDVHP PhD program, that's what they, uh, they do. We can tweak these images, we can look for different things. Um, so MRIs really gives us beautiful pictures, in-depth pictures of the brain with lots of tools, but it takes a long time. 
Some people are very claustrophobic. Some people are very large and don't fit in the scanner. So there's lots of reasons why an MRI isn't always our best tool. And very early on after a stroke, it can sometimes be hard, not for the trained eye, but for some of us mere mortals, it can be hard to sort out blood versus no blood on an MRI. Whereas on a CAT scan, it's straightforward. If it's blood, it's bright white. And if there's no blood, you don't see it. So um, a CT scan without contrast is still one of the mainstays that we can use. There are some challenges with CT scan because infarction or cell death or stroke will only show up after several hours. So early on, this, this is a stroke of the same patient on the left and on the right with two days of difference. So this is somebody who came in and within two hours they had a CAT scan. This is the skull on the outside, the bright white spot. You can see some dark areas. Those are areas that are normal. They can, they, they're um, the ventricles where fluid is produced and stored. And basically, if you compare left to right, they look close enough um, to each other. Whereas when you look at the right-sided image, there's no question that there is a triangular or wedge-shaped darker area that is uh, related to the loss of blood flow in that area. And that was because that blood vessel, middle cerebral artery blocked off and uh, did not supply this territory with blood flow and hence that tissue died. So it takes time for the ischemic stroke to show up. The hemorrhagic stroke is what I call just obvious, right? So there's a big, I call these goombas because they're just these big things. It's obvious there's something here that shouldn't be there. You don't have to go to medical school to see that. And that's blood and it's an intracerebral hemorrhage because it's inside the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhage requires some finesse, uh, but I think you can all appreciate there's some bright white along here. And then infarction, look at it, it's much harder to see. So the point is that a non-contrast head CT is very sensitive to find bleeding, uh, less sensitive early on to find ischemia, whereas MRI is very sensitive early on to find uh, ischemia. So here's an example of an MRI. So on the top, these top five images are a CAT scan on the same patient and below are five images, that's the corresponding MRI. And what you can see, or if you can't just trust me, is that the CT scan just looks the same left and right. I don't see any difference. But when we do a MRI scan, this in particular is called the acute diffusion weighted image about three and a half hours after the stroke symptoms began, you can see there's something going on on the left side of the image, which is the person's right brain. And again, very similar to that wedge-shaped area, this is early stroke. This was somebody who presented with left-sided weakness and they were 75 years old. So a, diff a diffusion-weighted MRI, very easy to find the stroke, takes a long time and lots of barriers. CT scan, very easy to see blood. All right, so now that we know a lot about stroke, are there drugs we can take that will prevent us having a stroke or that we can use to treat the stroke? And it turns out that on the right-hand side column are what we call drugs for secondary prevention. What can I do to prevent myself having a stroke, having had one before or having had a TIA before? It turns out that none of these apply if you've never had a stroke before. So that's an important distinction. And uh, we are not providing medical advice today. So please don't start any medicines without talking to your physician, um, of course, because um, there's always uh, reasons why something might be more or less uh, uh, indicated for a particular person. But typically we use drugs to prevent ischemic stroke that prevent clots. So aspirin, clopidogrel, and dipyridamol are three standard, been around a long time. And then there are clots, there are drugs that are perhaps a little more potent. Many of you will be familiar with warfarin, uh, also famously known as rat poison and not fun to be on because you can't eat salads uh, whenever you feel like it requires a lot of monitoring. And then there's a whole host of newer drugs, dabigatran, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban that have really changed how we take care of patients who might have had an ischemic event before and really have made it much easier to have a normal full lifestyle, not worry about your diet and they don't require testing. And we now have reliable antidotes for many of these. So if you come into the hospital and you're bleeding, we need to reverse these medications. We now have drugs that can help us to do that. If we see you early on and we think you're having an ischemic stroke, we need to break up the clot. And we can do two things. We can use a drug called Alteplase, which is a clot-busting drug that we actually infuse into your bloodstream and breaks up the clot. 
and we can do something called a mechanical thrombectomy. And a thrombectomy is where we go in and basically corkscrew out your clot. I mean, literally. So this device, there's many devices on the market. These are some examples. This device is like a little corkscrew and you basically go in with a corkscrew and pull out the clot, just like you would if you're uncorking a lovely bottle of wine. Um, the penumbra system is another one. This is the solitaire device. Here's a Trevo device that has clot in it. So these are simply mechanical devices. You go in, find the clot and retrieve it. And if we can do that early enough and restore blood flow to normal in the brain, patients who are otherwise devastated may have a phenomenal uh, outcome. So this is very early. The key here is time. So it has to be done soon after symptoms begin. In terms of the intravenous medication, which is very easy to administer in many locations, of course, we make sure there's no blood. We do a head CT scan, and we have to make sure we know when your symptoms began. So typically, it's about four and a half hours from symptom onset. So there's not much time to finish that dinner or to go and check in with your friend or go take a shower or put on your slippers. You get to the hospital as soon as symptoms begin. And we have to make sure that if we're giving you a drug that breaks up clot and causes bleeding, that you don't have any other reason why you might bleed. So things like low platelets, recent surgery, recent trauma. And of course, we like to think of medicine as a team sport. So a neurologist is very useful, but it turns out a neurologist is not as useful as an interventional neuroradiologist when you need to um, administer or use a device. So we need a a whole team of people who can treat the patient and any complications that, that arise. And uh, there's been a lot of movement in the country to have centers not named for their expertise. So there are now stroke centers and comprehensive stroke centers that basically refers to a holistic team that takes care of patients from start to finish if they have a stroke. If we find that you have a carotid blockage, it turns out we can open it up. And uh, some of you may have had a friend or family member with this. This is somebody who's just had something called a carotid endarterectomy. And this is a beautiful procedure because the carotid is easy to find. You simply open it up, clean out the inside, put it back together and Bob's your uncle, you're done. So very quick and easy procedure, very safe procedure in good hands and lowers your risk for stroke if that is what caused your symptoms. So if you come in and you had a TIA, or if you come in and you had a very small stroke, and we know that it came from crud in that carotid artery, fixing that is the important thing as soon as possible to prevent you having another event. It turns out that we can also fix it with stenting. So we can go in, open it up and put a stent in, and that prevents you having that ugly scar. You know, nobody wants to have that scar. I mean, you're modeling career is essentially over there, but we can go in through the groin and find that uh, blockage and open it up. So there's lots of reasons why somebody might rather be a candidate for a stent rather than an endarterectomy, uh, but typically you have to have had symptoms and they both have pluses and minuses, age being one of the factors we take into account. But on the whole, we now have two tools rather than one in the last uh, 15 years um, for the prevention of the next stroke in patients who have carotid disease. It's very important we find the cause of the stroke. We want to prevent the next one. So we look at the heart, looking for atrial fibrillation, looking for endocarditis. We look at the blood vessels, we look at the carotids. We can use Dopplers, we can use MRAs, we can use CT angiograms, and we can have the gold standard called digital subtraction four vessel cerebral angiography, which is where we put dye into the blood vessel. And sometimes we still do that. The intracranial circulation simply refers to the blood vessels within the brain and cells. And those are harder to see for obvious reasons. But again, MRA has really made it so easy that we typically don't use the others unless absolutely necessary. Once the patient is in the hospital and they've had a stroke and we've taken care of all of the acute uh, uh, events and we've decided what the best management is, we then need to take care of them and prevent complications. And it turns out it's, this is just as important as all the fancy schmancy testing we have. We have to make sure that we don't drop the blood pressure too much. We have to make sure they don't develop pneumonia. A simple bedside assessment of swallowing is likely to reduce the risk of pneumonia because somebody who develops pneumonia after a stroke is less likely to ever go home than somebody who doesn't. So simple assessments make a big difference. We prevent clots in the legs. These are venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. And if the stroke is big, 
one of the things that will happen over the next five to seven days is that brain that is injured will swell just like a bruise anywhere in your body. And that swelling can be deadly. And so we have to manage that. It turns out the more room you have for the swelling, the better off you are that you'll survive. So older adults tend to have small brains because our brains naturally shrink over time. So the swelling is not as big an issue if you're much older. It's a huge problem in the younger patient. And then of course, we work closely with our teammates in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and cognitive therapy. We treat the spasticity, which is the tightness that can develop after a stroke, the depression, the sleep disorder, you name it. It's really a team sport. But what is really important to remember is that rehabilitation is key. And the harder people work early on after a stroke, the more likely they are to gain function. Um, and so it's really important to think of inpatient rehabilitation after a stroke as a top priority if the patient is a candidate for it. It's associated with better outcomes. The challenge here is cost, right? It costs a lot of money. So um, not always attainable, but that should be our goal. And so, now we've heard about stroke, we've heard about TIA, different kinds and lots of different drugs. What can I do? What can you do? What can we all do today that will lower our risk for stroke? Well, it turns out we think of stroke factors, risk factors for stroke or TIA as uh, falling into two piles, essentially. There's the, there's the type of things we can't really change. Age, well, it's a blessing to get older, so let's not go there. Uh, older you are, the higher your risk for stroke, but I think of that as a good thing. Your sex at birth predetermines your risk for stroke. It turns out that women have few, less risk for stroke early on. We quickly catch up and eventually we actually make up for lost time as we get older. And then there are some genetic factors that can play into your risk for stroke. The things we can change is where we need to focus. I mean, this I can't emphasize enough, but high blood pressure, oh my goodness, diabetes, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, if you've had a stroke before or not, if you have uh, dyslipidemia, any kind of lipid abnormalities, if you uh, are uh, using a lot of tobacco for whatever reason, if you have trouble with alcohol, if you have obesity, which is defined as a basal BMI higher than 30, you know, physical inactivity and carotid stenosis, these we can fix. And so I would, uh, I'm gonna give you a little exercise in a moment, but I would just emphasize that the elements on the left-hand side are a much longer table of things we can fix. Here's the hard part. They depend on us, right? So we have to go out and exercise. We have to do certain things and that can be very hard to do. So working with your primary care doctor and your team to find ways to make this work for you is crucial. The most interesting recent data has come from physical activity. If you exercise every day, you can actually lower your risk for stroke in a measurable way. And it doesn't take much. 20 minutes of activity every day is generally what we think of as adequate exercise. So all of these factors are really important. So let's look at your own uh, risk and maybe you wanna take a pen and paper and make a note. And if not, you can just think about this, but what is your blood pressure? Do you know your numbers? If you don't know what your blood pressure is, I'm ch challenging you to find out. It is so important that your blood pressure be normal. I mentioned the REGARD study earlier. One of the interesting aspects of the REGARD study is that we found that if we can treat blood pressure, we can prevent dementia. I mean, imagine that. So not only do we prevent stroke, we can prevent dementia. Your cholesterol, do you know your numbers? You need to know your numbers. Lowering your cholesterol, controlling your cholesterol, getting it in normal is absolutely doable. It doesn't actually even require you take full control. You can get medication to help you with that because sometimes it doesn't matter what you eat. What are your sugars? Do you have diabetes? Do you have pre-diabetes? Do you know what your sugars are? That needs to be uh, something that you can work on. Get active, 20 minutes a day, every day. Eat better. What does that mean? Well, this one's complicated, right? So the Mediterranean diet is what we think of. Generally think of um, more fish, uh, more um, uh, fruits and vegetables and less processed food. And then a word about tobacco. You know, you know, I moved to North Carolina from Massachusetts and we couldn't talk about tobacco cessation. It was just not cool. For heaven's sake, this is our tobacco state, right? Well, it's cool. Smoking is no good for you. So no, you have to stop smoking. And then depending on your history, you may be somebody who might benefit from aspirin or one of the other blood thinners if you need it. So on the whole, you, there are things you can do. 
But what's most exciting about stroke is that we have so much work to do that will really change the, and move us even further down. I mentioned earlier, we went from third cause of death to five. It's because we've done better job with cholesterol and blood pressure and blood thinners, no question about that. Um, and because we just train people better and we have, I think, done better job of taking care of patients in the hospital. But what we need to do moving forward and what I challenge you to think about is primary prevention. How do we prevent that first stroke? Well, things like policy uh, uh, programs. How do we cease tobacco? It took a lot of, to uh, stop make uh, UNC a tobacco-free campus. We need to believe that policy can make these changes. Secondary prevention. It turns out, yes, you might take a blood pressure medicine and an aspirin, but it costs a lot of money. And seeing a specialist costs money. We need to think about how we can reduce those, those barriers, particularly for populations who are at very high risk. How do we deliver care? Turns out telemedicine actually is easy and doable, and many people have access to, to uh, specialty care that way. Why not use it? Well, because we don't get paid to do it sometimes. So we should learn from our previous mistakes and continue to motivate for access to care. And then we really have to help educate not just ourselves and our colleagues, but our families and patients. And of most importance is, is that once somebody's had a stroke, the burden of care to those around them is huge. I mean, it, they need a lot of support and we don't really have a social structure that supports the cost of care um, and that supports family members to deliver that cost of that care. So on the whole, you know, that's a bigger point and probably beyond the scope of today, but I'm really challenging to think about uh, these more broadly. So I appreciate your kindness and your attention and I will try and answer these questions. Um, so how would you, would you like uh, to call on the folks to ask their questions and then we'll go through them? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Felix, for that fantastic presentation. I feel transported back to my preclinical years. So really appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of questions. So I'll go ahead and call on uh, Farzan, who is our first uh, question asker and um, ask her to keep it to her top two questions so we can have a chance to have others ask their questions and if we have time at the end can come back to some of her other questions. Can you ask because I asked multiple questions I don't know which ones I should address. <laughs> yes um, yes so I guess um, I know there were a couple of questions you asked that were upvoted sort of at the uh, some of your earlier questions but really it's up to you you have the floor to ask you know one or two questions so we can. I see okay so uh, okay the question I had was like the angioma I know that there are different types of MRI, like for the brain, to see if the uh, cerebral malformation is kind of getting worse. It's not with stroke, but still relate with the brain. Which techniques for MRI is better, or do they have different places, like SWI, DWI, GRE? Which ones are, should you get all those uh, sequences as part of MRI check? Well, great question. So uh, obviously you know a lot about MRI and, uh, Neuroradiology is an evolving field and even MRI technology is evolving. And I feel like every week there's a new, a new technique we can use to find some new thing. And uh, it's always fun to work with my colleagues in neuroradiology. But to answer your question for cavernous malformations, a routine MRI without contrast will typically show it up. And uh, for small cavernous malformations, they may not need any therapy. So it's not uncommon that we do an MRI for some reason um, and find an incidental finding. It could be a small cavernous angioma. It could be something else, but not all malformations uh, are the same. And certainly a cavernous malformation is very different to an aneurysm. And so the risk for bleeding is very different. So, I mean, uh, should that patient get all those types? Because like, I think SWI shows the blood if it kind of bleeds. Should if there's SWI, been bleeding. SWI, GRE, all of them along with T1, T2 or just be specific? Yes, so very a very good question. Typically we have a protocol. So for ischemic stroke, the protocol would include SWI and a GRE because we wanna see if there's been any previous uh, bleeding and we can see it on there. So when we order an MRI, it includes many of those sequences. For acute stroke, it will include DWI. For a chronic stroke, that is not typically included. Well, so you're talking about stroke for DWI. I, I was talking about the malformation. You don't need DWI? You don't need it. You don't need oh, it. You don't need that. Okay. Okay. That's good. And then uh, one last question. Uh, you talked about the vertebr 
acelia, ischemia, does that cause a, a problem blurring only on one eye or both eyes? Oh, good question. So typically will be bilateral because it actually affects the um, cranial nerve nuclei. I sort of the brainstem has a lot of uh, important uh, anatomy that lives very close by. And so it tends to affect both eyes. It can just be one eye, but it would be unusual. So we think of it as more of a bilateral symptoms. And the reason I ask this question is that sometimes at night, mostly on my right eye, sometimes I see like a, a what do you call, grayish. I don't see very clearly in the dark with my right eye and then the left. I went to Duke, they did lots of tests, they couldn't find anything. So I don't know if I need any type of an MRI or anything of that nature. I, right. I didn't Great get question. So, yeah. Right, so typically the symptoms for uh, transient ischemia of the eye are, you know, it's very easy to find and it's not um, subtle. So if it's a stroke-like episode, it's usually easy to find. In my clinical experience, when I've looked and haven't been able to find it's because you have some unusual explanation for the symptoms, but definitely worth talking with your doctor about that. Okay. So I may have to get an MRI, basically, you're saying. I mean, no, I'm not saying that. MRI. I'm saying you're you, not saying. Yeah, you talk should talk to your, your doctor. doctor. Okay, got it. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I know we're kind of on time, but just to get to some of the questions, if we can um, have Gloria Thomas unmuted. All right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks so much for this uh, many medical school. I'm enjoying this. I, I came to this session in particular because I have a history of, of high blood pressure and stroke in my family as an African American. And I've been seeing a lot of, of research related to this uh, systemic racism that you know, African Americans have, have experienced over you know, the centuries and how that has been one of the factors that leads to uh, stress and hypertension. And uh, you were saying that there, this research is ongoing, but I wonder what actually happens. And I find myself in these situations where I get stressed out, my blood pressure goes up. And in, in the case of siblings, they've had strokes. Is that ischemic? Is that hemorrhage? What's happening in the brain when, when the blood pressure goes up and, and it leads to a stroke? That's a great question. So it can be either, but most commonly with very uncontrolled high blood pressure, we worry about the hemorrhagic type of stroke. Um, stress is an evolving um, understanding as to how it tr triggers uh, stroke. And we know more about heart disease than we do for stroke, but it is definitely an evolving area of research. So uh, to summarize, basically what's happening is if your blood pressure goes up, um, there's a lot of changes that go on in your, in your bloodstream. Now your brain is pretty good at adapting. Um, but whatever you can do to keep that blood pressure under control and reduce the stress is probably the best strategy to not get to that point. And sometimes it takes medication frequently requires a lot more than that. Um, there are some studies that have shown mindfulness practice uh, can help reduce blood pressure. Uh, exercise is definitely another factor. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Looks like Nate is addressing Tristan's question while we speak. So in the last couple minutes that we have here, um, Shreya, um, I'll have Shreya and then Daria, and then we'll wrap up for tonight. So Shreya, um, if you're able to, uh, Kevin, if you're able to unmute Shreya, she can go ahead and ask her question. So my question was in the diagram for the stents, it looked kind of like with the stent, they didn't, or I know with the, um, the one where you go into the carotid, you said they like clean it out. And it seemed like with the, um, with the stent, they might not be able to clean it out since they're going in and they're sticking something in there. So I was just curious about that. Great question. So it's actually very complicated. It is like plumbing. So you have to go in and figure out what kind of abnormality there is and then assess whether you can uh, just use, deploy your stents. So some of the stents are actually, um, they hold themselves up. So they're self-expanding and they gradually expand over time. Um, sometimes we use a little balloon to open up the area first and then put the stent in place. Uh, but it is quite technical. So you're right to have that question. And the answer is it depends. We don't take them out. Once they're in there, they stay there for life. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, I guess just for our last question or two here, Daria, um, if, if you're able to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was super uh, informative on the pathology of different neurovascular diseases. And my question is, you mentioned that with embolic ischemia, uh, ischemic stroke, that things like endocarditis, and all those obviously not the most common cause, some things stem from the heart directly. So in that case, it affects all organs. So how exactly do you juggle treating the underlying cause with preventing more brain damage? Oh, what a great question. So it depends on how sick the patient is, right? So it's not uncommon in endocarditis, uh, people get very, very sick. Um, and oftentimes we have to address the underlying cause. So typically we'll target the endocarditis as the primary um, underlying condition if it's safe to do so. Occasionally the person is just too sick and we can't tackle that. So then we try and do the best we can to prevent ongoing injury, not just to the brain, because you can imagine whether it's atrial fibrillation or endocarditis, those same clots can break off and go to any organ. The brain just happens to be the one that we are talking about today. Right, thank you. And also on the same note, you mentioned that cell death in the brain, and I mean, in general, starts to occur after about four minutes. So given that right. TIAs last for 10 minutes to four hours, why isn't there more significant brain damage that can be seen through imaging besides some uh, diffuse weighted MRI abnormalities? Well, because the cells, once they're through that, they basically, they have reversible ischemia. So they return to normal. So the imaging shows us that they're back to normal. There isn't any permanent um, uh, chemical apoptosis kind of event that leads to the cell death, which leads to changes in the sodium potassium channels and how much intracellular water you have. And that all, re all that determines how things look on an MRI scan. So basically I think of TIA as being a very transient event. The cells are on the edge. They typically recover fully. MRI is normal. You might see a small diffusion weighted uh, defect. That always makes me worry that I'm missing a stroke. But typically what we do there is see if the patient gets all better uh, if necessary, repeat the imaging um, at some point in the future. Thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, we're thank you all for the excellent questions. We had one more question about um, how best to get in contact with Dr. Felix for follow-up. Dr. Felix, I wanna give you a chance to let us know how people can sure. find you. You can feel free to email me and uh, I will just add that this week is a little busier than most. I typically will always get back to email, although it may be a few days. So if you would just give me the grace of time and if I don't respond, feel free to send me a gentle reminder and I will greatly appreciate that. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Felix and, our, and Sarah for your time. I'll go ahead and paste uh, Dr. Felix's email address in the chat box and she has graciously offered to <laughs> address questions um, when possible. And I do know that there was a YouTube video um, called What is a Stroke Animated Explanation Video that I also included a link to in the chat box um, that Dr. Felix wanted to direct attendees to. So again, thank you all so much for attending and for your engagement and really wonderful questions. We really appreciate it and appreciate all of the help of our panelists and our technical support and students involved in the committee. If you're able to join us next Tuesday, we will have on the 16th, same time, um, our third session on cervical cancer. And just wanted to give a heads up that um, that may be a shorter session. We may just have our students speaker for that evening due to some scheduling conflicts, but um, we will have opportunities for Q&A as well. So we hope to see you next week. And until then, take care, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week. All right. Bye-bye.